Hello and welcome everyone. Um, this is our second event for our Copyright for Open Science series, an open air initiative exploring a sustainable and just uh, uh, model for open science. Uh, this time we're going to focus on the US uh, landscape and we're going to discuss fair use and statutory licensing. And our invited moderator today will be John Wilinski, professor at Stanford uh, University. And before I hand over to him, I would like to very quickly go through some uh, housekeeping notes with you. So our session today will be recorded and we will make the recording uh, publicly available shortly after uh, our session. Uh, please keep your microphones muted uh, during the session. Feel free to unmute and turn on your cameras for the Q&A at the end of the session. And you can and always use the chat box if you would like to share a question or some comments with our speakers and moderator. Finally, if you're on Twitter and would you, you would like to tweet about the session, you can use the hashtag C4OS and tag Air. And with this, I would like to hand over to Professor Wilinski. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. Uh, let me welcome everyone as well. In fact, let me welcome you to turn your cameras on uh, so that we can have an audience, a uh, difference in approach perhaps, but I appreciate uh, doing it live with people. Um, I also want to thank Prodromus uh, Savos uh, for the support that Open Air has provided for this series on copyright for open science. Um, today, the focus is on the US and Canada. I'm a Canadian and David is as well. So. Um, I want to welcome uh, that aspect. Um, we're looking at this uh, concept of, of the legal approaches to open science and our overall title of from fair use to, to statutory licensing. Um, but our focus is largely on open science and open access. I want to open with uh, two comments, um, two statements. Um, I have to say, and, and I do want to apologize that uh, the gender balance is completely missing from this panel. And I thought we had put an end to all male uh, panels, but we haven't in this case, but we certainly did work and try hard to get some of that. And one of the people we invited um, was Alondra Nelson, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who's the head of the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And August, on August 25th, um, OSTP issued a, a policy directive with regard to access. Um, and in particular for removing the embargoes on the NIH and federal government research, sponsored research. And in that statement, uh, and in that statement, we have uh, her comments. Um, and she says, let me quote, when research is widely available to other researchers and the public, it can save lives, provide policymakers with the tools to make critical decisions and drive more equitable outcomes across every sector of society. The American people fund tens of billions of dollars of cutting edge research annually. There should be no delay or barrier between the American public and the returns on their investment in research. Um, and I wanna balance that with a statement that I read yesterday uh, in the New York Times. Um, this is from Claire uh, Farrell who's the co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, which is a climate protest organization. Um, <clears throat> and what she says, uh, which she's quoted as saying yesterday, uh, and to me, this has a lot to do with advocating for a democracy that isn't just more inclusive and more representative in terms of her protests, but more just, uh, but also, and more just, but also wanting to have a democratic society where more people have better access to the truth and to information and to really understand what needs to happen and why. Um, and these are both very encouraging for someone like myself who's been working for 25 years in this space known as open access. I'm afraid I remain deeply concerned that our best strategies to date have yet to deliver more than a third of the research litter in an literature, not litter, please, uh, more than a third of the research literature in an open form. Although a greater proportion of more recent work is open, and it's increasingly so, um, I still think we are short on a clear path to open access as a key element in open science. What has changed is that we now have a consensus among scholarly communication stakeholders, by which I mean researchers, publishers, librarians, scholarly societies, and funders, that open access is a critical part of a new era of open science. It strikes me now that there is time, there, it is a time for a coordinated effort among these parties. 
And I welcome open air in creating this opportunity to bring together librarians, legal scholars, and publishers to consider where we are in this process of doing what is best for science and whether it may be time to join together in considering legal remedies um, for the shortcomings and delivering the desired good open access in a timely fashion at a fair price. Given what it could mean for addressing our current climate emergency, the next pandemic, and even the rise of generative artificial intelligence. So at this point, I want to turn to uh, the speakers who have generously uh, decided and have, have uh, participating in this event, decided it was worthwhile. Um, They're going to respond to two statements. I'm going to give each of them a chance to speak and I'll introduce them in turn. But let me share with you first the, uh, the statement that will be guiding their initial thoughts. Um, and we're going to start with the open science aspect of this uh, seminar. The digital air tr uh, transformation of research, sorry, the digital air has transformed research. And in the process, um, we are framing a new right to research. This involves the right to do research, utilizing new forms of text and data mining, as well as the right to the research through open access. And I'm asking the participants, how would you judge the current state of these rights? To what factors would you attribute their progress and the challenges they face? Do you have a sense of how text and data mining and or open access will continue to unfold over time? And what would the endpoint, if any, look like? That's a lot. And I ask you to be choosy and, and come in where you wish on these questions, but your perspectives are important for an understanding of how we sit with the public, with publishers, with um, librarians, and with intellectual property scholars. I want to turn first to Jonathan Band. Uh, Jonathan uh, helped shape the laws governing intellectual property and the internet through a combination of legislative and uh, advocacy. He has represented clients with respect to the drafting of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Stop Online Pri Privacy Act, as well as being working in the area of the Marrakesh Treaty, the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Mr. Bannett is an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center. In 2017, he received the American Library Association's L. Ray Patterson Copyright Award. He holds a BA, magnum cum laude, at, from Phi Delta to, and Phi, Delta, Phi, Beta, Phi Beta Kappa, please, uh, from Harvard College and a JD from Yale Law School. From 1985 to 2005, uh, Mr. Band worked at the Washington, D.C. office of Morrison and Forrester, um, including 13 years as a partner. Um, but in 2005, he established his own law firm. Jonathan, um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, John and Open Air, for uh, for having me. Um, you know, these are very uh, very big questions, uh, and easily could you know could talk about it for an hour. Uh, but I'll I'll try to just give some very high level thoughts uh, in in a few minutes. So, uh, and first, I must preface my remarks by saying that I'm a I'm a copyright lawyer. I am not a researcher, you know, I'm not a scientific researcher, I'm not a, 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 a really an academic. And so um, uh, I'm not, I'm in the legal and policy trenches and not in the sort of a, a, a publishing or uh, academic trenches. Uh, and so, uh, so, so one, one, one should assess my views with, uh, with that, uh, with that caveat. Uh, so, with respect to the first question, um, the right to, to do research, for example, text and data mining, in the United States, there's sort of like good news and bad news, certainly relative to the situation in Europe. So, the good news is we have uh, the, the, the fair use doctrine. It's an exception that's in our uh, Copyright Act, which is a codification of uh, over 100 years of U.S. copyright law, but it's really derives from the uh, English uh, uh, copyright law and the and the fair dealing provision there, um, and and that allows it's it's sort of a flexible uh, provision that allows a court to decide that an act is fair, and um, over the last 30 years, the courts in the United States have uh, interpreted and applied a fair use. 
extremely generously and broadly. Um, and so if you if you were a copyright law, so actually when I was a when I studied copyright law uh, in law school in let's say around 1980, um, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote a certain group of cases and had a certain understanding. And, and if you had a, a, a copyright lawyer from the you know 1970s uh, and then fast forwarded to here, they would be shocked at the uh, uh, the change in the fair use jurisprudence and how much it has allowed. Um, and uh, uh, fair use was used to be applied in a much, much narrower way. So there's really been a revolution of fair use and certainly rights holders often argue that uh, it, it's, it's it, it, you know, this, the, the pendulum has swung too far and that it's courts are misapplying or over applying fair use. Of course, that, that applies until they're sued for, <laughs> for infringement, at which point they are very happy to rely on all of the fair use jurisprudence as of all. But, but the, the, the key point is that it is very uh, broad uh, and, and has allowed for courts uh, to accommodate uh, the, all the changes that come with uh, 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 technology and, and have been able to really allow fair use to be uh, not an, an, as much of an impediment in the way of uh, uh, research. And so, for example, the, the case law, uh, in the, you know, there's been several cases where sort of assembling the database for purposes of text and data mining has been found to be a fair use. So the courts have been very responsive uh, and have been uh, uh, really, you know, accommodated, allowed copyright to accommodate digital technology in generally and research in particular. Um, uh, now, to some extent, the courts have had to do it because Congress has not been able to. I mean, our Congress is, uh, it's, it, it's always dysfunctional and to some extent it's been, dis it's dysfunctional by design, uh, but it's very hard to get anything through Congress, uh, particularly in the last 20, 30 years. And as a result, um, uh, uh, the Congress has not been able to you know, accommodate the, the digital technology to the extent the courts have. And so the courts have had to play, play that role. So that's the, the good news is that the courts are doing it. And certainly, whereas you know, every once in a while you'll have you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the EU bureaucracy will come up with another directive, you know, most recently the Copyright and the Digital Single Market Directive, which has various provisions, but, but overall it is a much more uh, rigid system, less flexible. So that's the good news, that the courts have been interpreting copyright law well. The bad news is that um, uh, we, uh, we do not have really this concept of contract override that, that has been developed in, in Europe. Uh, and as a result, one could, if, if one uses a license, if one licenses the, tech, the, the, the information and then in the license prohibits uses, then um, at best, it's uncertain whether that license is enforceable, that license term, and at worst, it's, it is enforceable and you're not able to engage in that activity. And so to the extent that a lot of, even, even, if, uh, even if we're talking about a, um, um, a uh, 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 so, you know, it's material on the open web that you just find you're scraping a website, but if the website has a, um, uh, if the website has a, uh, a browser app license that prohibits the uh, use of the text and data mining of the technology of the of the information, then you know there's a good chance that 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 if you were to text and data mine, that you might be you know you run the risk of being found to be in breach of contract. So so we don't have the whereas in Europe there are many. Uh, both at the directive level and then at the individual country level, there is a lot of there, there, there are these contract override provisions, which basically say that a, a contract term that is contrary to an exception is not enforceable. And so, in that sense, uh, the, the right to research is once it's defined in Europe, it's more solid because it doesn't matter what the license says. On the other hand, here we might have broader, more flexible rights from a copyright perspective 
but it's very easy for the publisher uh, to uh, to limit them. Then just very quickly, because I know I'm going over my time, but just very quickly on the second part on the you know the open access part, we'll we'll talk more about that later. Um, uh, I'll just say that I I share to some extent uh, John's disappointment that open access hasn't gone as fast as uh, I think all of us would have hoped. Uh, you know, it, it is making progress, it is moving forward, but uh, not as quickly as one would like, and, and we need to sort of explore why that is and how do we solve that problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to turn now uh, to Kyle uh, K. Courtney. Kyle K. Courtney is a lawyer and a librarian serving as the copyright advisor for Harvard uh, University Library. He is a published author, nationally recognized speaker on the topic of copyright libraries and the law. His writing has appeared on copyright has appeared in Politico, The Hill, Library Journal, American Libraries, and other publications. He's a co-author of a white paper on controlled digital lending. Um, he has a fellowship at NYU's Law Engelbert Center on Innovation, Law, and Policy, and is a member of the U.S. Supreme Court Bar, an advisor to the American Law Institute's project on the restatement of copyright, a co-founder and board chair of Library Futures. He holds a JD with distinction in intellectual property law and an MSLIS. Kyle, uh, please. The what are your views? Thank you so much. Um, and again, thanks uh, to Open Air as well. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a cruel twist to have two copyright lawyers in a low limit themselves to five minutes on these topics, but I'm going to do my best. Um, and I'll note, I, I do have a science degree, so maybe I am furthering open science a little bit, my master's in information science. Um, so uh, I'd say that the right to research is the newest approach to the current laws that we have and, and hitting on what, what Jonathan said to a certain extent, perhaps even addressing the problem and updating those laws, but the advocacy behind it, the recent push for the right to research to me is very exciting, right? This is happening across the globe. Uh, I love that. I firmly believe the fundamental underpinning of any US-based right to research as it exists is based on the current laws that we have here in the United States. And as, as Jonathan pointed out, that provides the framework for many types of these uses that we're looking at. And, and certainly because we are in the US uh, and that's the focus of today and the in the title was the known fair use, fair use is invoked as the key component of this right to research. So it has a fairly good track record of providing academics, researchers, journalists, doctors, and citizens the, the rights they need to both acquire and complete their work. And as we've seen in various surveys, uh, law review articles that that have examined the scope of fair use here in the United States since this introduction into the Copyright Act, there are fairly predictable outcomes if your fair use that you're proposing falls in favor of you know two or maybe three of those four factors. The challenge, of course, here I think is that, uh, and I think it's a challenge to all cultural and in knowledge institutions and library and archives and their users, right? Uh, that that challenge is certainly licensing. Um, our, our patrons are the researchers, authors, and creators of the open science movement, but they're hitting the same walls that we're hitting from the perspective of these libraries. So I, I would say that licensing culture is slightly out of control, and it's starting to encroach into the fabric of fundamental fair uses in service of, of greater open science and education. So that's one of the barriers that I see. Open science does not benefit from a very restrictive license culture, right? Uh, but I, as I firmly believe, there are good licenses and bad licenses, right? Um, we can have licenses that further open science and also um, uh, contribute to, to, to the purpose of the license here. The fact that this market analysis exists of whether or not something is licensed as a barrier creates a, a problem for legitimate TDM research, um, non-consumptive uses of copyrighted materials, um, you know, you know, text and data mining falls in this camp, certainly, but there's a variety of different methodologies by which open science is gaining access to these material or needs to gain access to the material to do something new and different. So I think there's a presumption that there should be a license. And if there's not a license, that activity has to be licensed. And, and that's, that's my kind of fear. And it looks like licensing research uses might be the next great money-making scheme to drive profits in areas where um, they've gone down and you know print sales are down and, and things like that. So that's a concern and, and one challenge 
since many of the publications that we're talking about are driven by private for-profit firms that don't necessarily have a stake in the outcome of open science, but they have a great stake in their stock prices or shareholders, right? So it's, it's, it's a conflict. Um, however, one remedy that's been in effect here to mitigate this, uh, this influence of strong licensing and pricing is certainly open access. We've seen open access proliferate across academic institutions and now into the publishing field. Um, uh, and But as we know, open access has been one answer, but not necessarily the answer to the problems that are raised by the right to research. Um, and open access is based on the, a fundamental principle that the writer, the, the creator, the scholar is in the best position to make decisions about their work and what they're producing. And the U.S. Copyright Act gives them a nice non-exclusive license to share with academic institutions for everyone to gather up. And I, and I consider this one of the more powerful provisions in the copyright law to maintain some control over your copyright, but also meet the researcher's goal for wide dissemination and use, all while promoting the progress of science and the useful arts, which is the ultimate goal. Um, and the scholars are doing this writing rights for something other than profit, right? There's a moral high ground here, and we'll talk about that, I think, in the next question. But as far as reaching an end point, um, I think we're very much at a fork in the road right now. Um, with the rise of you know, licensing only culture and the use of new and efficient technologies, that help and promote research and publication, I think we're looking right over the precipice, right? Um, but as to the part of, of, of uh, John Walensky's question uh, about, is there an end game? Where is there end point? Um, I don't think there's an end. There's a variety of options that we're staring at, which is why we're having this meeting here today, which is why the right to research is growing. Um, but many of us on this call agreed to this Sisyphusian lifestyle, right? And we've been doing it. So I think we're always going to be pushing the rock up the hill in the open science space. Um, and, and this is an opportunity to kind of um, separate the, the two, right? That we can still have dissemination of knowledge and make it available same lights and also satisfy what appears to be the market forces that are affecting that. So that is just about five minutes. <laughs> Very good. Kyle, that's uh, perfect. Let me um, take the moderator's license and just make it clear to the audience that the, there's a distinction between fair use and open access that needs to be made, that uh, fair use is a limited uh, right that uh, was introduced into American copyright law in 1976 um, and had particular pertinence with regard to photocopying. It was the age of photocopying uh, in the 70s um, and with uh, allowed for the copying of a uh, typically a single article um, with a photocopier and uh, fair use has been expanded as Jonathan points out, but it, uh, the question of open access is access to the entire literature, um, which is not something that is ever going to be covered by fair use. It's access to um, a the body of work um, that is needed for by a researcher. So it's not just, uh, I just want to be clear that these are two paths towards open science, and it's not as if one is going to be adequate to take care of both, um, or at least uh, fair use is not going to be adequate, let me put it that way. So a little intervention here, but but let me go back uh, to our uh, process here. And, and at this point, we're fortunate enough to bring in, um, after uh, hearing from uh, the legal side, both from the practical um, legal work that Jonathan does and the um, the counseling uh, that uh, Kyle provides. Uh, Curtis is uh, our next speaker and he is the Associate University Librarian for Scholarly Communications and Collections at Iowa State University. He oversees collections and is an active in the effort to transform scholarly communications and I can attest to that. Uh, his work focuses on advancing open access, controlling prices and increasing transparency. He currently chairs the uh, Open Access 2020 US Working Group and is involved with several other groups working to transform scholarly communications, including, including the Subscribe to Open Community of Practice, uh, where a number of us are involved. Um, Curtis, um, I welcome your views. Well, thanks, John, and thanks, Open Air, for, for having me. Um, not often, I mentioned to John uh, when we just before the webinar started, I'm not often on panels talking about copyright and to be absolutely clear, I am not a copyright expert. I deal with uh, copyright as it relates to licensing and collection and open access work. And my comments will be within that channel. So quickly, Iowa State is a, is a mid-sized US research institution. 
Um, we've been pursuing open access agreements, trying to convert our traditional subscription spend to supporting open access. And to date, our agreements are making about 25% of the articles coming off campus open access. So those are license agreements through the library so our faculty don't have to pay anything to publish. So, so I definitely believe the, um, the ability to participate in open science and to benefit um, from open science continue to be severely restricted. Libraries are in a really weakened position when they need to negotiate back rights through the terms that we argue with, with publishers about. Um, that's the case if we're trying to, you know, get our, our preferred text and, dining, and data mining clause in an agreement. It's the same with price. Um, basically, when these rights are given away to publishers, libraries are not in a very strong position to get any of them back. We have some successes and we have a lot of failures. Um, I, I think that the, the right to publish open access um, when we think about these, these rights to research, I don't think there is a right to publish open access in any meaningful uh, legal or practical way. And an example of that, you know, here at Iowa State, we have an agreement with the, the publisher Wiley. So one of our faculty members who wants to publish with Wiley, the library will pay the charges to make that article open access. You drive down the road from Iowa State's campus about 20 minutes, you can be on the campus of Des Moines Area Community College. A faculty member at the community college who wants to publish with Wiley, um, they do not have an agreement. So if they want to publish, that faculty member is going to have to pay for that, probably out of their own pocket. And that problem of the unfunded author who may be at, a, at an under-resourced institution, they may be unaffiliated, that's a problem in the US. It's a problem at our tribal colleges, at our historic black colleges and universities. And I think we all know it's a problem, you know, in many parts of the world. So this is just a huge, huge issue. In fact, I think it, it's, an, it's an embarrassing problem for us to have because when you think about, you know, the, the organizations that are responsible for this, this place that we're at, you know, these are our universities. Um, they're our scholarly societies, they're our funders. And when you look at these organizations across the board, what you will see is that they will have statements saying that they care about equity, that they care about an inclusion, and yet, you know, here we are. But with all of that said, I do think that we have been making some progress with open access. I think there's been a lot of innovation. I think models like Subscribe to Open that's already been mentioned, I'm sure Richard will talk more about it, um, are really encouraged. Subscribe to Open will deliver equity both for authors and for readers, and that's really important. And other positive things, you know, if you didn't know it, um, as of last week, we are officially in the U.S. in the year of open science, according to the OSTP, and that's really, really exciting. Um, to see this administration pushing open science, the new guidance coming from the OSTP, this is all great. Um, but... I balance all of that, like that optimism with just, you know, I'm not cynical about this, but I just think that when we look at the OSTP guidance, I think it's likely going to prompt, you know, revenue driven publishers to move, you know, kind of faster toward a, an article economy where they will receive upfront payment for those articles before they become publicly accessible. And what could this look like? Well, it could look a lot like, um, and when I say publishers, like I work a lot with Richard and I respect annual reviews and I respect a lot of publishers. So I'm going to talk more when I talk publishers during this session, I'm thinking more of the revenue generated commercials and large non-commercial publishers. And I have a feeling that they're going to be morphing into something more like MDPI. And if you're not familiar with MDPI, they are a volume based publisher. Faculty on my campus love them. We're seeing explosive rates of article growth. How anybody can pay for that, you know, sustainably, I have no idea. Um, and if we see Wiley, Springer Nature, the rest of them pursuing that path, it's going to be, um, I don't know, it's not going to be great. And I have a lot of worries about it. Um, these publishers are going to try to collectively grow like this overall article pie. 
And then there's gonna be you know, competition in air quotes um, for growing their individual slices of this pie. But we know that the big dominant publishers, both commercial and non-commercial have gigantic advantages in this competition. So we will see more consolidation. So ending on my really negative note on where this is all heading, <laughs> Um, I think revenue will continue to be the driver. Um, advancing open science may figure prominently in these types of profit-driven publishers marketing materials. But in reality, um, open science will be incidental if it's a consideration at all. And that's where the note of cynicism definitely comes through for me. So. Curtis, uh, thank you so much. We needed that critical, I wouldn't call it skeptical or cynical, but it, that critical perspective, um, particularly from the library representing faculty, representing students, representing uh, public communities as a state institution. So I very much welcome in that regard. Let me turn at this point um, to David Feuer, to the, back to the uh, legal side of things, or at least the um, uh, JD. Uh, David is a general counsel of the University of Ottawa's Samuelson uh, Glushko a Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic. This is Canada's only public interest technology clinic, um, CIPPIC, what an acronym. Uh, its mandate is to advocate for a balance in policy and lawmaking on issues arising out of new technologies. Um, David joined uh, in 2004. He graduated with a BA in 93, with an LLB in 96, and a Master's of Law degree in 97, all from University of Toronto. But he has, he has clerked at the federal court, practiced law, national firms in Vancouver and Ottawa, and appeared as a counsel before all levels of Canadian courts, up to and including the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, David, thank you for agreeing to appear and to contribute here, and I turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you uh, to uh, Open Air for inviting me as well. Uh, yeah, our, our mouthful of a name. We go by CIPIC up here, C-I-P-P-I-C, oh, okay. CIPIC. <laughs> it's much easier. Um, yeah, I, talking about appearing before the Supreme Court, every time I do, I have to have this discussion with them. We're known as CIPIC. Um, our, uh, our, our mandate uh, involves an awful lot of copyright. We do, uh, I've been doing basically uh, somewhere between 50 and 100% uh, of my practice uh, focusing on copyright for 20 years, the 20 years I've been here at the clinic. Uh, that experience has not made me uh, an optimist for getting uh, uh, socially optimal uh, copyright solutions uh, in place in Canada. Uh, we've had more success we have found uh, in Canada in the courts in advancing kind of a public interest perspectives on copyright. Um, in, in Canada, uh, talking about the, the right to research, we, we would primarily look at, at that concept as falling under fair, fair dealing or into the, the user, uh, what we call the user rights uh, groups um, of exceptions and limitations in, in, in the Copyright Act. Canada has a very interesting and, and somewhat unique pr perspective on copyright uh, developed over the last uh, two decades, starting with a big Supreme Court decision uh, just after the turn of the millennium. Uh, where we see copyright as um, primarily being uh, an attempt to balance interests, user interests on the one hand and, and owner interests or author interests on the other. Uh, and almost any attempt uh, to, uh, to legislate or to address um, you know, uh, copyright issues before the courts, before parliament is going to be couched in this language of balance. It's actually interpreted, an interpretive principle of the Copyright Act in Canada. It's, uh, it's that strong a view. Uh, so any look at, at research rights or text and data mining in particular, which we're looking at here, is going to be looked at from, from that perspective. Uh, the primary tool for, for, uh, for protecting research in, in the in the uh, text and, and data mining cont uh, context is going to be fair dealing. It's our equivalent of, of fair use uh, up here. It looks roughly after, uh, after 20 years of consistent Supreme Court decisions kind of uh, advancing the, the, the scope of, of uh, user interest under fair dealing. It looks very similar to fair use. Uh, same kind of ideas uh, are at play. We have a six factor test, whereas in the States you have four, everything in Canada has to be a little bit more regulatory, a little bit more complicated. So uh, that's the approach. Uh, and it's a fairly strong user's right. Uh, I, 
I would be pretty confident um, in any lawsuit going up to the Supreme Court, at, you know, where, where even commercial text and data mining uh, was at issue, uh, that there'd be a strong claim that that kind of activity would be covered by uh, fair dealing for the purposes of, of research or, or education or one of the other um, uh, purposes in the, uh, in the fair dealing provision. Uh, others don't share my, my view. Uh, uh, and they think that kind of the expansive nature of text and data mining, the fact that it uses the entirety of the work that it's, you know, it, it, and not just a work, but libraries of work, uh, the scope of, uh, of mining as an activity potentially takes it outside of fair dealing. Uh, I'm, I'm not so skeptical. Uh, the court has, uh, the courts in Canada over the last 20 years have shown kind of a willingness to be, um, uh, let's call it open-minded or, or uh, mindful of uh, what is actually necessary to achieve the outcome in the use at issue. And so I, I've, I still think that uh, fair dealing is probably the best home for text and data mining in Canada. Now, that having been said, there are those who disagree and have been advocating for kind of a safe harbor provision in Canada. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical of uh, that route. Uh, whenever strong user interests have come before um, parliament, uh, we haven't necessarily fared well. Uh, they've often been limited, they've often been uh, qualified or, or additional requirements put in place that aren't necessarily consistent with uh, the outcome that any particular dealing uh, requires. And it's, it's actually a strategy of um, kind of authors interests within government to make exceptions um, uh, difficult to use. Uh, and so I, I'm a little bit skeptical of this approach in Canada. Uh, so, you know, there's a question, you know, what is the future? What does the end game look like? There is no end game to copyright in Canada. That is one thing that I've learned. Uh, it's likely is to become something that's uh, explicitly addressed. If we do see movement uh, in Parliament, there was a recent consultation uh, that looked at AI and, and copyright and, and did make some uh, um, you know, have a discussion about uh, text and data mining. Uh, but I think it's most likely to come ahead in Canada if it goes to the courts. Uh, that's where that's where that will happen. And how that will happen is likely a collective in Canada, you know, a, a, a collective administration, uh, collective rights administration entity would seek a tariff on, you know, data mining of music, for example. It's, I, to be honest, if I had to place a, place a bet, that's where I think it will become an issue in Canada. Uh, and then the second most likely place is internationally. It's difficult to get copyright legislation in Canada. I, I described it as blood sport to John not too long ago. Uh, so uh, where we do see a significant movement on Canadian copyright revision is when we enter into some international trade agreement that requires um, some, some elements. And so I could imagine uh, a text and data mining limitation or, or exception um, with qualifications built around it being something that happens internationally that we have to deal with. Uh, now on open licensing, uh, the position in Canada is, well, it's relatively strong. It is, it's not that all of Canada's post-secondary funders require, um, you know, open, open access publishing, uh, but the tripartite, uh, the tri-agency policy that the three big major funders of Canadian, um, uh, Canadian academic uh, uh, research have made it a requirement um, that all peer reviewed journal publications resulting from funding through the agencies will be freely available within 12 months of publication. And that's a, been a huge boost to the, uh, to the uh, open access movement in Canada. It's far from perfect, as I said, certainly far from all of our funders requiring this, um, but there's greater uh, uh, awareness of these factors. I, you know, when, when my organization puts in a, a funding application, we always, you know, include funding, uh, you know, uh, funding line items to, to deal with that. Uh, that having been said, um, th there is a good argument that to be made, and we're going to get to this in the second part, uh, that if there's a, a, a particular policy objective, policy solution that we want to arrive at, it's got to be done legislatively. Open publishing is kind of a, you know, open access publishing is kind of a, it's almost like a hack. It's a hack of of copyright in the same way that Creative Commons is a hack of copyright. Uh, and it requires, you know, all parties to the transaction to get involved. If we really wanted to focus on making 
scientific research uh, kind of universally accessible, even in the academic context, uh, then that will require uh, a deeper discussion. We'll leave it at that. All right, I'll always stay with that. Uh... <laughs> the idea that more research is needed and a deeper discussion. But I want to say um, about the end point, because I did introduce that, and it does sound, uh, I'm not trying to suggest there'll be an end to copyright legal uh, uh, action or uh, the court. So I don't want to put anyone out of business here, certainly uh, not yourself or Jonathan and, and, and or Kyle in that practice. Um, but we do arrive at end points. I referred to the 1976 Copyright Act in the US. It provided a kind of end point on photocopying. Um, not entirely satisfactory, but it it was a resolution and it hasn't uh, been challenged in any series. I mean, it was as far as photocopying was going to go. So I think the, that's partly what I was heading for in that in that aspect. But let's um, let's continue on this uh, first question. And um, at this point, we have our final um, perspective from Richard Gallagher. And here we have the publishers uh, side of things. Um, Richard is the president and editor in chief of uh, the nonprofit publisher annual reviews that has already been referred to in a very favorable way by Curtis. Uh, he spent 10 years, uh, Richard did, in immunology research at Trinity College Dublin before moving into publishing. He has held senior positions at Science, um, one of the top journals in the field, where he led the Europe office and at Nature, another of the top journals, um, where he was the chief biology editor and publisher. Since joining Annual Reviews in 2015, he has led the development of, a new, of new journal titles. He's overseen the launch of the bilingual uh, general science publication, uh, Noble Magazine, and he has participated in creating the subscribe to open approach to uh, open access publishing. Uh, Richard, um, we welcome your views at this point. Thanks very much, John, and thanks also to Open Air for organizing this really interesting discussion. Um, I come at the uh, question of copyright reform as a potential solution to the problems that I'm facing rather than having a very deep understanding of, uh, of, of the issues um, uh, that it would raise. And, and, and so this has been very educational for me. I should say that I'm not speaking on behalf of, of publishing generally. I uh, actually share the concerns that Curtis raised about the big commercial publishers. And so there's a very specific topic on what one small nonprofit publisher um, is doing in, in terms of open access. And I'll, I'll concentrate on the right to access research through open access and end with a couple of comments on the right to perform research via text and data mining. Um, in our case, making content open access is really a corollary of our institutional mission. Annual Reviews is a nonprofit publisher dedicated to synthesizing and integrating knowledge for the progress of science and the benefit of society. It's beyond question that open access supports the progress of science. I think the benefit to society of open access is mostly seen as indirect flowing from the improvements um, for researchers and, and, and their research. But um, I wonder whether um, open access should have other direct impacts. Who besides the re research community should have the right to access research? I think the answer is everyone, policymakers, business and labor leaders, practitioners, educa educators, parents, uh, people with elderly parents, all of us can benefit from uh, open access in a, in a very direct way, but there are obstacles. The literature is really difficult to navigate. It can be fearsomely complex. It's terse, it's jargon ridden. So even if um, it isn't behind the paywall, open science can't be described, I think, as, as fully accessible. And, and that's something that, that we need to address. Given annual reviews expertise in synthesizing uh, complex issues, we are aiming to bridge this gap between science and society. And there are three components to this effort. The first is to make all of our content open access. It's, uh, it's the foundation. The second is to summarize the reviews that we publish for different audiences, such as policymakers, CEOs, um, activists, um, as John mentioned earlier. And we're working to provide information that they will find useful in a format that they want. 
And third, uh, again, as John mentioned, we want to contribute to science journalism through Knowable magazine. That content is also free to read and republish. And the articles are um, appearing in the Washington Post, the Atlantic, and BBC Future site, the Smithsonian Magazine, and, and many other outlets republish them, making high quality scientific information available to readers um, via their medium of choice. So open access publishing, I think, is um, necessary for the new right to access research, but I don't think it's completely sufficient. We must also deliver uh, research to non-research communities. Um, a word about our approach to open access funding, which, uh, which John and Curtis mentioned, uh, we use subscribe to open whereby research and teaching institutions continue to subscribe to our content on the understanding that it's published open access using CC by licenses. I think that you can see that there are some similarities between um, John's proposal for copyright reform in, in, in the sense of, of who's paying for the, for the work. Um, subscribe to Open has certain benefits over the um, current um, uh, most used approaches to fund open access, which are a APCs and transform transform transformative agreements, especially in terms of equity. Um, and it's now been used by more than a dozen smallish publishers, and certainly not by any of the large publishers. Uh, this year, it's our intention to make all 51 of our journals open access and we are on track to make that happen. Um, the conversion to open access is really underpinned by a very strong sense of partnership between us and our library customers. More generally, it's supported by a subscribe to open community of practice where representatives of libraries, publishers, funding agencies, and the research community work together to develop the approach. So I would say at this exact moment in time, there's real optimism in our little corner of the enterprise. But if I look to the medium to long term, both for annual reviews and for academic publishing as a whole, I anticipate a great amount of turbulence. Um, there may be scores of different approaches to open access to juggle. Um, there's these very real existential questions about the future of the academic literature. And it's certainly not helped by the overly commercial nature of, of the sector as a whole. Uh, for someone that needs to protect the legacy of a 100 year old organization and to uh, consider the future of 100 employees livelihoods, um, it's a wee bit too exciting um, at the moment, I think. So this is the reason that I'm interested in uh, ideas for a comprehensive strategy uh, based on, on copyright reform. I, I think that that's one way of, um, of, of, of creating uh, some, uh, some stability. Uh, turning to text and data mining, uh, obviously knowledge discovery through um, data mining is an incredibly powerful approach that will accelerate science. Our role is to be a useful partner in the ecosystem. So we support these efforts to the best of our ability and we do so by following the recommendations of the International Council of Medical Journal Editors. As a review publisher, we actually have fairly limited experience in making author data sets available. It's usually just written reviews that, that we publish. And my casual reading around the subject is that there are challenges and that these are beginning to be addressed. I do suspect that as with open access, ensuring equity will be the intractable problem more so than technical difficulties or funding issues to be overcome. Uh, so this will uh, um, include avoiding unintended negative consequences or the use of data mining for ne nefarious purposes. And I'm really not sure how to assess and ensure equity in, in the area of, of data mining. Text mining is a bit closer to home for us. Of course, that's happening all the time without any intervention on, on our part. We do have restrictions on bot traffic on our, on our um, uh, products, but specific projects agree to have access um, with our content host, uh, our, our, our hosting organization um, at upon. 
Um, I really have to mention chat GPT. It's the talk of the steamy at the moment. And I think it's certainly going to evolve into something that will assist in the creation of our content um, and also maybe evolve into something that competes with us, which is uh, another concern on the horizon. So in conclusion, um, I maybe in contrast to others think that the right to research is kind of lumbering along in the right direction. Um, we small publishers uh, tend to support it, but we have to be careful that it doesn't stand on our toes or completely knock us off our feet on its way on, on its way along. Um, all of the stakeholders need to get more closely aligned. Uh, this is uh, one step towards doing that, I think. And I think it's important that we ensure that the benefits of open science are broadly available um, across society and not just to the research community. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That was a lovely uh, summary of all the issues, in fact, uh, with a particular perspective um, of a publisher of the integrity and, and quality of uh, annual reviews. Excellent. Uh, we're going to turn at this point, in fact, to some of the issues that you raised and the others have raised, um, and turn, more specifically, uh, with regard to copyright. Um, and that is the possibilities of what can be done. Uh, here, the statement that you've been asked to respond to is that there is the role that copyright plays and might play in the pursuit of open science, um, because it has been nearly 50 years since Congress introduced a limited uh, exception to the U.S. Copyright Act that I've already referred to, um, that, which makes allowances for photocopying, um, and which did address the needs of science, but there's been very little change uh, to the law, I would argue at least, uh, with, regard, with regard to promoting the progress of science since then. Um, do you feel that this is a cause for concern? That is that the copyright law is overdue uh, for changes uh, and updating with regard to the digital era that we've now been introduced? Um, or do you believe that this, uh, the changes that we face in terms of digital publishing are something that uh, is best left to the market and market forces to sort out? Um, do you see a potential case for reconsidering copyright's role in open science? Um, or looking for possibly other forms of government or regulatory action on this front. Uh, given this interest in copyright review, what hopes and apprehensions do you have, would you have, sorry, if Congress were to consider how the Copyright Act could better serve societal interests in promoting the progress of science in the digital era? Uh, we'll go back in the same order, but without the introductions. Uh, Jonathan Band, I turn to you. Sure, so thank you very much. Um... Uh, so again, uh, trying to be brief on a very broad topic, but um, uh, as a general matter, as I said, I, you know, I think uh, you know the fair use doctrine has uh, been flexible and has been applied uh, well by courts. I trust courts much more than I trust Congress uh, to deal with this or probably just about anything else. Um, and but but with respect to the specific issue of open access and how do we promote open access and what is the best way to promote open access? So I, I, I have a, a bit of an anecdote um, uh, on that's sort of uh, on an adjacent issue, but it, I think it illuminates this issue. So I'd say about 15 years ago, I went in with some uh, of my clients, some uh, representatives of library associations we went in to meet with uh, someone on the House Judiciary Committee, a staffer, and uh, uh, what we were talking about was, you know, the mergers, uh, all the different mergers that were going on in the scholarly publication field, which, you know, sort of on, you know, an ongoing concern, consolidation, monopolization, and then also how that all was leading to the increasing price of journals, which has been certainly a, a, an enormous an issue of enormous concern to libraries. And, you know, we sort of were explaining to the staff or the, the, the overall situation, how, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, researchers get grants and they create, um, you know, they, they create articles uh, and, you know, they do research, write articles. They then license those articles to publishers and the publishers um, charge libraries hefty subscription fees, and those, those subscription fees keep on increasing dramatically. And the staffer said, so, so let me get this right. He said, you guys create the content. You guys then do the peer review for the publishers. 
and then you buy it back. And you know, you're basically, you're giving your content away to the publishers and then you're buying it back. And we said, yeah, I guess, you know, that, that's basically what's going on. We create it, we edit it, and then we pay for it. And, and, you know, he looked at us like we were sort of like these silly little children. And he said, this is your problem. This isn't my problem. This isn't Congress's problem. This is your problem. You have the power to fix it. Don't bother us. All right. You fix it. No one here is going to have the slightest bit of patience or interest to help you take care of your own problems. And, uh, you know, sadly, I think, you know, he's right. I mean, and, and, and with open, you know, and that, that's with, he wasn't referring specifically to open access, but with open access, it's kind of even, even worse, right? It's where the, the government is paying for the creation of the content. And, uh, and then we're, we're, you know, we feel that we don't, you know, the output isn't sufficiently open. But but it's it's and when I say it's our problem, it's not. I'm not just referring just to the academy, but it's. I think it's also the funders, right? The the, you know, the institutions that are funding, you know, the government institutions that are paying for the creation of all this content. You know, th they're part of the solution too. But it really is our problem. Uh, we need to work with them. You know, you know, the 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 academy and the funders need to work together to come up with a more sustainable solution. Um, and that sustainable solution may, you know, would certainly involve, uh, you know, small society publishers, right? I mean, the, you know, clearly, clearly the academic societies and their, you know, th those non-commercial publishers certainly should be part of the solution, you know, whether it's getting direct funding from the granting agencies or the grant includes, you know, it, it's built in or something, you know, and it's certainly easy enough for the large, you know, the NIH to sort of decide how it wants to fund the publications to make sure they're sustainable. But, but, uh, uh, but to sort of involve copyright law for a non-copyright problem, right? I mean, you know, open access was an, is an alternative to copyright. And it's, a, it's an alternative to copyright that arises because it's, it's all government funded, right? The institutions that are creating it it's, are government funded. The, you know, the, the people who receive the grants, are it's, it's all government money. And the libraries are government funded. And so given that it's all a government funded universe, the government with us needs to come up with a, an efficient solution to make sure that everyone who needs to get paid gets paid so that this, you have a sustainable model, but to sort of involve copyright law and then to involve uh, uh, sort of more middlemen. So not only do you have commercial publishers getting involved and in deciding that they deserve to get all, you know, in perpetuity their share of the money, but even, you know, libraries paying for subscription. I mean, it's a, it's a much more inefficient way of doing things. So I, so I, I really think, you know, we need to, um, understand what exactly the problem is with make, making sure that we're, it's more sustainable and then come up with solutions that would be sustainable solutions. But since, again, at the end of the day, it's all, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, the academy and, and the funders, you know, they need to sort of figure out what the best way is and go forward. And, 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 and let me just touch on just in closing, uh, uh, um, John's point about, well, you know, there's consensus, every, there's consensus that open science is best. And I said, you know, I, I would respond, there is consensus to a certain point or to a certain level, but, but you still have, you know, academics are still, you know, they, they believe in the abstract in open science, but, you know, if, if Nature Magazine comes along and wants to publish their their article and it's not it's closed but they're they're you know they feel that that's important for their career to publish in nature magazine and uh uh and and if you know if they think it's good to be with uh oxford or cambridge or whoever you know university press that's very close they will do that and they'll happily sign over their rights without a second thought and so again, in the abstract, everyone believes open science is the better approach, but when it comes to what's like, what's good for me in my career, everyone sort of runs off and does their own thing. 
And so uh, until at the end of the day, we get our house in order, we, we can't expect other people to help us. And, and also, and again, let me say, if, if we get Congress involved in the solution, it's gonna be a lot worse than we think. You know, the, the, the solution will probably be worse than the problem. Okay, okay, Jonathan, thank you for that. Um, nice way to set off the discussion. Um, Kyle, I uh, turn it over to you at this point. Thanks. Um, Jonathan, now that committee assignments are largely shaken out, at least on the House side, maybe we'll have some en enlightened staffers in the near future. <laughs> um, but I think John's st story there illustrates the perfect capitalistic system in which we're working, right? There, it's not our problem because the system's being exploited for the workers and system for profits, and it's not in favor of open science. Like, this is your problem. The system's exploiting workers, and what are we going to do about it? Um, and that's a far cry from where copyright came from, right? Um, you know, copyright was so important in this country's founding, at least, that it made it into the Constitution. Right, you know, they invented the post office, then they had const, then they had copyright, and that's great. And the ideal language that we've been repeating here, but I want to repeat again, was to promote the progress of science in the useful arts. So, progress of science. In fact, the first Copyright Act, seventeen ninety, was an act for the encouragement of learning, which is just a great title, right? Dissemination of knowledge was necessary. So, the question uh, that our, our our gracious host asked is, I think it presupposes that fifty years have resulted no action or behalf of the users or on behalf of open science um and this limited section was 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 photocopy sure it started as photocopies but certainly in reality the last several amendments to the copyright act have been driven by for-profit market forces as opposed to individuals researchers or cultural or institutional needs that actually have a greater stake and uh, in open science and can make a contribution to it so when there's a bill introduced, generally, that would purely benefit the public, and again, that uh, assume close to the core of copyright's uh, true meaning or true purpose, at least as I see it, it does not always make its way through the legislative process if there's no money on the end of it, right? And th there's an imbalance in the representation in the form of lobbyists, dollar figures, expenditures that moves legislation into the realm of another money-making scheme. And that's certainly, I echo uh, John's concerns there. Now, thankfully, we've seen this re referenced twice, apparently both here and in Canada, the courts have been the true champions and guardians of the purpose and promotion of, of science and the useful arts. Um, and fair use here has seen its expansion into new and novel interpretations just as you know, the development of transformative fair use over the last 30 years. So just because Congress has an act, it doesn't mean there hasn't been progress in the promotion of and pursuit of open science. But I will add that courts are equally as susceptible to market forces at time, right? They have bigger lawyers on the other side. Maybe they have more money. They have more time to expend this. So if Congress considered how the Copyright Act could better serve social interests in the accomplishing the goal of open science, um, it would have to do it in a manner that bucks the trend of current congressional legislation, right? It would have to be, uh, you know, devoid of the lobbyists that seem to control that particular industry. We tracked the billions of dollars that are spent in influence in legislatures every year. We, we know this. And we're often outgunned in terms of influence. And that's just the reality, right? But this is despite our moral high ground. And I'll, and I'll go to that point. Is the moral high ground enough that open science would save lives? And I'm hoping that's always a convincing argument. Open access, by the way, would save lives too, right? In the same way, it's taken 20 years to take hold. Getting this information to the doctors, to the scientists that can treat their patients, this is great. But if you track copyright's legislative greatest hits the last few decades, right? We have the, the Case Act Small Claims Court, which some think is a troll factory. We've had the, the Teach Act, which is supposed to enhance copyrighted works and online learning, but it came more, more out like a, a burdensome regulation. Um, you know, I was on a PhD dissertation committee a few years ago, and the student was examining whether the last few decades of copyrighted legislation has promoted the progress of science and the useful arts. And I'll summarize the dissertation briefly, and it was no. Um, so I have the same concerns that there is a legislative solution here. 
Um, but if they were to go in and, and do this, we would have to win the argument through this moral high ground, which I think is the best argument for open science, but not necessarily the legislative winning argument. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold there because there's going to be a lot of other great comments on this. Okay, I want to give everyone an, an opportunity. Curtis, um, from your perspective. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. So I don't feel leaving copyright accommodations for science to be sorted out by the market um, would be a good idea at all. There's a, I guess we could call it an alignment problem between the values of open science and the values of, um, you know, a purely market-based approach as pursued by, you know, revenue-hungry publishers. Um, I think open science advocates want to accelerate and improve science and knowledge creation. You know, they want to, they want to position research so it can better address, you know, the problems that, the, the many, many problems that people on the planet are facing. And the market forces in scholarly publishing seem to me primarily to be about preserving and growing revenue returns first, you know, and again, you know, we hope that open science comes in is, is a second in those considerations. Um, I do see some interest from stakeholders. I would think there would be interest in some stakeholders in reconsidering copyright's role in open science. I think the rules we're working under and other folks on this call know a heck of a lot more about this than I do, but um, standing on the sidelines, I mean, these, the copyright rules look completely dated and like they were not written for the world that we live in today. But what would it take politically to actually get reconsideration and reform moving? You know, I have a lot of reservations about what our current politics would produce and hearing, you know, what Kyle and, and Jonathan have to say makes me even more nervous. Um, I think there'd be great risk of special interest capturing that process. I just feel like, you know, as Kyle was saying about the lobbyist and things, it's, it just seems like we would open a, a, we would open up something and we may not be happy with what comes out the other side. I feel like it would in some ways at some point be out of our control. But if we were to do it, like there's obvious low hanging fruit that we could pursue, you know, shortening the duration of copyright, getting done with these retroactive extensions, figuring out what to do to make orphan works open, you know, so there's a lot of things we could accomplish. Um, but I guess I would move back to my previous concerns about, you know, these market forces that are in the, that opening question um, and the alignment problem between open science and, you know, revenue focused publishers. Um, when we talk about you know, the consensus around making these changes and, and doing something with copyright. I don't see the big commercial and the big, you know, nonprofit publishers who really want to, you know, preserve and grow their, their revenue. I don't see them supporting this. Like, I think the situation that they're in today is they're still making all of their money to open up the can of worms for copyright reform would introduce a lot of uncertainty. I think for them to, to take part in this process, I think it would be because the current market is uncertain. The current market is risking the revenue. And even with the OSTP memo that's coming on, I think that the publishers are adapting enough that I think they're very happy with being able to continue on with the status quo. So I don't think that's a stakeholder group. In particular, the big revenue hungry publishers that would be interested in this. But I I believe what Richard said, you know, we need a comprehensive approach. And if one part of that is pursuing copyright reconsideration and reform, I, I'm all for it. Because I just think we have not figured out how to do this yet. And we need to try as many things as we can to try and get to where we want to be. Uh, I want to thank you, Curtis. Uh for touching on my uh, position, uh, as it turns out. So I appreciate that. Um, let me uh, keep the conversation moving. We do want to have some time for questions at the end. So um, that's partly why I'm um, speeding through. But do take your time, uh, David, and in addressing this question about copyright and bring that Canadian perspective in, in terms of uh, legislative approaches or regulatory approaches or however you see it. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just echo, I think, what, what we've heard. I've got, um, I have some skepticisms about the ability of the marketplace uh, to address kind of our broader public policy objectives around science. Um, you know, the ultimate objective here is not necessarily, you know, an efficiently operating publishing marketplace for, for um, works of science or works of the arts, um, but it, instead truly the advance of science uh, and the arts. Uh, and I, I do think there is role, um, uh, especially in a place like Canada, if we can move this discussion outside um, of the kind of the, the control of the traditional copyright um, policymakers in, in the government, and we kind of bring broader perspectives to bear on this particular problem, maybe we could, we could achieve some su success. But that that hope, I guess, is is a, a squash like a bug by my experience of doing copyright policy work in Canada. Um, I, I do think that this is an issue that that this is a policy question that should be addressed based on the best evidence we have about what achieves the outcomes we, we desire. Uh, and I think always think it's worthwhile to have that discussion. Um, uh, you know, but you know, given the interest in copyright policy review and what kind of happens. Um, you know, when we do that in Canada, I, I, I'm so skeptical. We do have to break it out of kind of the traditional confines of how we do copyright policy uh, uh, revision in Canada. Um, so I have faith in mandatory licensing in theory. It, it, it does operate well, it can operate well. The, the point was made earlier that this is, um, you know, largely government funded research by, uh, people who are, are funded by the government to do this research, who are paid by the government to do this research. It's reviewed by people um, who are paid by the government. Uh, it's ultimately used, again, by government-funded uh, researchers, um, though, of course, it's a broader community than that. Uh, you know, the, you'd think that there would be an interest in having a solution that, that kind of takes those that reality in, in perspective. But the reality in, in, in Canada is that uh, you know, the, 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 the real politic, copyright policy advocacy and the practices of the institutions that oversee copyright policy just make me skeptical. They just make me think that, uh, much as we hear from the other commentators, that this is a process that's likely to be uh, sidetracked and that the, the real policy objective, uh, the promotion of science and, and, and whatnot, is likely to get lost and, and put aside. Um, by the interests of the publishing industry and by the interests of um, certain authors, um, you know, who's, who have very loud voices in, uh, uh, in copyright policy in Canada and get, and get ears as a result. Um, the collective, for example, in Canada, that's likeliest to be placed in charge of administering any kind of uh, compulsory license doesn't have a great track record of appreciating and understanding the wider needs of the academic community writ large. Uh, they've taken us to court time and time again and lost time and time again uh, on these issues. Um, one solution might be to have educational institutions form their own collective for administration of, of, of these kinds of uh, these kinds of licenses. Um, so it's not that, you know, it, it, it's one size fits all. Um, second, the copyright board, uh, which is the tariff administrating uh, uh, institution in Canada. Again, it doesn't have a great track record of appreciating uh, copyrights balance. Um, again, it's it's overturned time and time again by the Federal Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Canada, precisely on user rights issues, the kinds of the kinds of rights that, that we're we're talking about here. So uh, I've I've got some skepticism about the institutions that we would look to uh, to oversee um, you know the, these kinds of solutions. Um, these are practical concerns um, that would require reform, I think, to address. Uh, and then finally, from a more, uh, I don't know, let's call it a, a, uh, you know, a, a jurisprudential perspective, I worry about the impact on fair dealing outside of this community. So if we're saying that this activity with respect to these stakeholders is a compensable activity, what does that mean for other stakeholders um, dealing with similar rights you know, outside of this community? Uh, will we see fair dealing, uh, you know, um, you know, narrowed, uh, which is a concern. Um, you know, here we're, we're treating, 
you know, in, in a mandatory license scheme, we're treating this as a liability, right? Right, basically a right to get paid. Uh, elsewhere, though, copyright remains a property right, right? The right to exclude. Uh, and in an academic institution, that's particularly uh, problematic. The right, to cons the right to exclude is the right to control uses, uh, which is completely antithetical uh, to the mission of the, of the university. And so we've got some kind of fundamental concerns uh, about playing around with entitlements in this space and for that reason i think you know and that reason and the tremendous success we've had defending fair dealing uh before the courts um i think i think kind of leads me to conclude that that uh, fair dealing remains our best and strongest uh hope for kind of asserting uh kind of a community of rights within this space um but that doesn't mean that that's the end of the discussion it just means that there's a very strong counterpoint uh in this discussion Yes, and we're not short of counterpoints, but one more is absolutely welcome, David, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Richard, uh, let me uh, turn it over to you to conclude the uh, this part of the presentation. Thanks, John. And I'll be brief. I mean, I think there's an urgent need to stabilize and regularize the conversion to open access. I've spent half my time over the last four or five years developing this strategy that allows one small company to convert to open access. And this has been replicated company by company, also, as Curtis will attest, institution by institution, funder by funder. So much energy is being used that could be much better directed in genuine service to science and society. Um, on the face of it, copyright reform looks or looked <laughs> like it might provide a comprehensive, um, stable, potentially even-handed solution. And I haven't come across other possible ways to achieve this. Perhaps the one nation, one subscription approach in India has some characteristics that, that might be of interest. I, like others have said, I definitely don't believe that uh, market forces uh, would provide healthy conditions for open science. It would accelerate consolidation and commercialization and really heighten the tension between right to research and the maximization of profits. We wouldn't be where we are on open access um, this far if we'd relied on market forces. I think it was the intervention, um, most particularly of Coalition S that's dragged us to where we are now. Um, having said that, there's obviously concerns about copyright um, reform as a tool. Uh, I'd be worried about surrendering autonomy um, to uh, the central body um, I think it, I'd like to know a lot more about um, the uh, Music Modernization Act and how the various stakeholders that were impacted by that um, have have felt that it's worked for them before we would uh, before we would abandon this because there may be a blueprint there that 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 we could uh, that we could um, use. Um, I, I think another concern is that um, this should be a co coordinated, whatever we do needs to be coordinated across the world. It's not something I think that US or the US Congress should set the blueprint for. Um, John, I know you mentioned a UN body might become involved, but I think that if there's going to be legislative action, there should be um, simultaneous legislative action in different parts of the world to mm -hmm. uh, make it an equitable and um, and comprehensive solution for everyone. So it struck me as a bold proposal that could provide stability and direction. Um, and I would love to see more discussion of the concept. I've certainly learned a lot about the downsides in, in this conversation. <laughs> yes. Um, there is, uh, just to jump in a little bit at the end, but I, uh, in doing so, let me uh, invite the audience, uh, those who remain with us, to pose some questions in the chat. Um, and while they do so, I would uh, just address Richard's question about the international aspect and, and point to the Marrakesh Treaty, um, where countries agreed to uh, introduce on behalf of um, hearing impaired and visually impaired, uh, rather hear visually impaired, um, readers and and uh, participants in, in uh, intellectual discourse to um, have legislation that supported um, their needs and interests um, in terms of copyright that protected their interests 
Um, so there are examples of international agreements to have uh, a uniform policy globally. Um, that's too brief a summary of it, but um, it's a starting point. Um, so are there questions um, from the audience for these few minutes? Or how about questions from uh, panelists across? Um, not everyone has taken the same position, I must say. Um, and so maybe there are uh, questions. Um, I, I think uh, Jonathan, for example, uh, I thought it was interesting that the uh, anecdote, uh, that was a lovely way to start, by the way, and I very much focused the mind. It's your problem. Um, but then so much of it is the government's involvement in terms of research funding. It is the government's problem. And if the government uh, is involved in a deal that is not working well, then a government response seems a reasonable course. And legislation is only one form of government response. There are other regulatory mechanisms besides legislation. Um, so let me, uh, how do we resolve that conundrum? That it is not the government's problem, but it is the government's problem. I, 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 it is very much the government's problem, but but I think uh, what the staffer was suggesting it was sort of like the the, the funding agencies and the, uh, the 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 grant recipients, you know, so the the academy. I mean, it, 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 he's sort of saying it was their problem, meaning it wasn't his problem as a member of you know as a staffer of Congress, and that. Um, that it, it is this this problem can be solved entirely by the granting agencies and the academy sort of sitting down and figuring that out and and deciding that this is a priority. Um, it doesn't they don't need anyone else's help. They don't need Congress, you know, because they they already have the money, right? I mean, the NIH, you know, they're already appropriated, you know, the you know, the 30 billion, 40 billion, whatever it is, and they decide how to allocate that. And they could just make sure that it's allocated in such a way that some of it is, you know, right. up front is, is allocating, it gets to the, the publishers who, uh, you know, they've decided, or they in coordination with the, um, uh, the Academy have decided are going to be you know the 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 you know the publishers. But who... that would, I mean that the NIH is uh, uh, Richard's a very good example with fifty three or fifty odd titles, only one or two or maybe three are involved in NIH research funding, and there's a great deal of research outside of that. Um, and I and from my perspective, at least the the efficiency of of the research investment I think is one thing, but the betterment of research more generally. So giving the taxpayers their value, which has been one of the approaches to open access, is, is a perspective. Um, but I think it loses sight that the progress of science is in everybody's interest and isn't simply an investment question, a return on investment question. Um, but others, uh, I don't want to monopolize the conversation with Jonathan. What, uh, John, can I ask you a question? Please. After, after looking at your book last night, this statutory licensing approach to me there's like two potential difficulties with it so one is there needs to be and there's a lot but two that i would just like to ask you about one is like there's a registry where there needs to be agreement on what publications go into a registry to qualify for compensation the other is who pays and that's what that's a question i'm going to ask you because i think it might be quick but so funders and, and institutions contribute mm -hmm. what about corporate users and yes individual users and the local high no. school. No. So who's in and who's out as far as who contributes right. to this? So um, this would be something to be decided. I don't want to make all the decisions, but my sense is there would be a threshold of use for an institutional user. Um, the lab, an R&D lab at Microsoft or at uh, Tesla would be an institutional user of research and that could be established. We do track these things. The, so um, the, the price itself, there would be a court of appeal. There would be in Canada, a copyright board in the United States, copyright judges. And so libraries would have for the first time a chance to exercise their privilege as a willing buyer instead of a hostage, uh, uh, being a subject uh, to a hostage situation. So that to me is a really uh, a positive part of this statutory licensing. Um, 
The question about the registry, just very briefly, um, is a matter, and I, and I appreciate it coming from you, Curtis, as a librarian, because I see the library profession, the information science behind library, uh, librarians' work um, is something that does determine what is research, what is a quality article in terms of research, what do we want to support as a library. So those decisions that librarians have always made, academic librarians, research librarians, would be part of this process. There would be appeals and there would be changes over time, of course. But compared to the music industry, where I do take a lot of examples, we are much more sophisticated around the nature of um, our work. Um, we have a science with regard to it. Um, we're much more sophisticated around the ownership and attribution of our work compared to the music industry. So I think we're in a good position there. But this is, uh, uh, yeah, too little a forum. And, and um, we do have a, a uh, I should say, um, in Athens, we our next meeting of this group of, of Copyright for Open Science is on February 9th. Um, we're having a hybrid meeting, but with some in-person components. Um, in Athens at the Onassis Center, and uh, it would be a wonderful opportunity to continue. Um, the proposal that you've introduced very nicely at the end, perfect timing, Curtis, is a great segue to the Athens where there will be um, a full opportunity. Um, Curtis has just put a link in. My book is open access through the uh, Direct to Open program at MIT, which is based on the uh, uh, subscribe to open model that uh, Richard uh, helped introduce. So let me um, draw everything to a close here in the final minutes by thanking um, our speakers, uh, uh, Jonathan and Kyle and Curtis and David and Richard. Um, it has been a, a pleasure um, to have you here. Um, I wanna also thank Open Air again, uh, particularly Athena and Prodromus uh, in terms of their support. And I want everyone to mark their calendar, the time zones, I'll never get right. Um, but uh, I think essentially, um, on February 9th, it will, you can tune in between uh, 12.30 and 5.30 Eastern European time. Um, but there's more information at the same place that you registered for this event. There's more information on the Athens event. Um, and no one has ever said that February is the best month to visit Athens, um, but it is uh, relatively, uh, shall we say, tourist free. Um, at that time, um, and the Acropolis uh, could be yours, or in, in the Parthenon. So um, at any rate, uh, let me close at this stage. Athena, do you want to have a final word or two um, for our audience? Thank you, John. Uh, no, I think you covered everything. You can find the registration link uh, on the chat. I'll also link to our dedicated web page so you can stay up to date. And Athens is never not busy as well, but it, it is okay. a good month, I think. And the weather is uh, quite pleasant at the moment, so it will be nice. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all.